the intersection of voting power and equity. Um, we'd very much like for this to be an interactive and engaged session. So please feel free to use the Q&A function at the bottom of your screens to ask questions once the panel begins. Um, and Tamara, our moderator, uh, will we'll take them on as makes sense. And before we begin, I'd like to say just a few words about our organizations before handing the mic to the panelists. So first on Leadership Now. The Leadership Now Project is a membership organization of business and thought leaders who are committed to high impact solutions to renew American democracy. Leadership Now has four guiding principles that tr transcend political parties. One, to protect democracy while renewing it. Two, to promote fact and evidence-based policymaking. Three, to create an economy that works for all. And four, to embrace diversity as an asset. In June of 2020, Leadership Now members launched the Business for Racial Equity Pledge, which asks individual business leaders to advance eight act actionable anti-racist initiatives within their companies in three key areas, policing reform, safe ballot access and civic participation, and economic inclusion. Um, secondly, I wanna to touch on Dahlberg. Um, who is our co-convener for this conversation. And Dahlberg is a, group, is a global group working to build a more inclusive and sustainable world where all people everywhere can reach their fullest potential. They partner with and serve communities, philanthropic institutions, governments, and companies, providing a mix of advisory, investment, research, analytics, and design services. They're shaping an equitable future in the US webinar series, of which our conversation today is a part, is convened by Dahlberg's Justice, Equity, and Economic Mobility Practice, which works to build a more equitable and just society for all people in the United States. Without further ado, I'd like to hand it over to Tamar Mokhtar and our panel. Hi, good afternoon, everyone, for those on the East Coast. Um, it's my honor to, to stand uh, virtually beside some of these incredible founders that have been at the vanguard of so much of so much important work uh, over the course of not just the last three or four years but long before that and hopefully uh, long after this particular cycle comes to an end a little bit of background for those that don't know um, about all americans vote the work that i do about three and a half years ago uh, i began the work of along with my partner of doing in-depth literature review and data analysis about all of the efforts that went into um, sort of the shortfalls that led to some of the uh, shortfalls that led to the outcome of the 2016 election. Um, our efforts were brought forward to establish a hypothesis that we could test in 2017, 18, and 19, and finally scale, hopefully, in, in, in scale in 2020. Um, the aim of these tests was to radically improve the efficiency and efficacy of methods uh, deployed across the progressive ecosystem. As a result of what our venture capital approach is in terms of investing in organizations that can uh, contribute to that hypothesis, we vetted literally hundreds of organizations and funded dozens of them. Um, in the summer of 2018, I spun off uh, All Americans Vote as a 501c3 arm of this uh, general concept uh, with the general principle of engaging and turning out uh, young voters and voters of color uh, across uh, the country. I've had exposure and worked very closely with the three founders that we have here today. Um, very proud to know them and proud of the work that they have uh, executed upon over that time frame. Our funding principle relies very, very heavily on the power of the founders. And what we have with us today are three of, of, of those that are just absolutely best in class. Um, with uh, with Angela Lang at Block Wisconsin, um, we have somebody that is a legitimate, literal 365 day year organizer. I actually spent some time, I think it was in, it may have been in March of 2019 in Milwaukee with Angela. Uh, March of 2019 is not remarkable in any election cycle. And I spent the day with her and her team and watched as 30 or 40 people of all different backgrounds sat around doing exercises at like the graduate school level of civics specific to the milwaukee area and they would spend whatever it was 30 or 40 hours a week doing this type of training in march of 2019 and then go out within the community and bring forward what they learned and make sure that it was able to seep into the community in significant ways remarkable remarkable work um, my first exposure to the black voters matter fund um, and in working with, uh, with April England Albright and her founders, Latasha Brown and Cliff Albright, uh, was just heart, was heartwarming as well as data informed. Like there's a good combination of those two things as they bring power through love throughout the community. Uh, Cliff and Latasha and April talk about 
the blackest bus in America as this Black Voters Matter bus travels the country just spreading this concept of year-round permanent empowerment through love and, and, and through the activation of Black voters. Um, I actually, my son got to take a tour of the bus, so I have a warm spot in my heart for, for the energy centered around that. And then with Tristan Wilkerson and his partner um, over at Think Rubik's, Dewana Thompson, uh, what they have done through their Woke Vote and Righteous Votes campaigns is they have managed to bring forward what is now accepted in the canon as best practice, and that is organizing and mobilizing at communities from within communities. Much of what I talked about with Angela as well, much of what I'm talking about with April. Think Rubik's does this by virtue of an intensive fellowship program, by virtue of getting students within HBCUs to recruit and speak and engage within their HBCU community, uh, faith, people in houses of faith to recruit and move within their houses of faith, and people from within the general black community writ large. Um, and we did a randomized control trial, or at least we did a, a, an after action uh, analysis of what they did through the Analyst Institute and found that their outcomes in 2018 were off the charts. They were able to actually make direct contact with 45% of their universe and their universe were the hardest to reach voters in the country. So as I said, these three founders represent work that is outsized in terms of impact and among the very, very best uh, that we have in the, in the ecosystem today in terms of engaging black voters in significant ways. So I'm very, very proud to be here and we're all gonna learn something today. So I'll start with, let me start with Angela. I guess I'll go alphabetical by first name. And I'll throw the first question to you. I'm going to toss these questions out a little bit. But before I do that, actually, let me back up. Angela, is there anything you want to add about Block Wisconsin? And then we'll go to April and then Tristan. We'll do that quickly. And then I'll toss a few questions out there for you guys. Yeah, I think what I would add um, is that a little bit about our origin story is that we launched in November of 2017, much due to the response of the 2016 election, um, one hand being the outcome, but also it was very, very frustrating for a lot of us to sit by and watch that um, a lot of folks blamed our community specifically for the outcome of the election. Um, that was, I think, the, the really big motivating factor for me and a bunch of other folks. And, you know, having to constantly make the case that we are some of the most least engaged and most disenfranchised, yet we were the ones to blame. And so we basically said, screw it, we're gonna do it ourselves. We're gonna hire folks from our community. We're gonna train our community up. We're not just gonna parachute in um, a couple weeks or a couple months before an election. We're actually going to build something. We're not going to be transactional. Um, and we had to earn the trust of our own community when we first started knocking. People were like, what are you really here for? What do you really want? What, you know, who are you gonna tell me to vote? for because people um, didn't know that um, people actually care <laughs> about their issues um, if they if they did get a door knock and a lot of folks we talked to said I lived here for five years and have never got a knock on my door if they did get a door knock it wasn't asking them their thoughts about how to make a thriving black community so we try to do things differently um, and really take a lot of what I've seen personally and experienced um, as a part of traditional thing and electoral work and really kind of spin that a little bit on its head and adapt that to work for our community here in Milwaukee. And Milwaukee may or may not be a super important city in the 2020 election. I heard that somewhere one time. <laughs> uh, April, you want to give us a little bit about the Black Voters Matter Fund? You're muted, April. Sorry. You have that on your Zoom uh, video that, card. I think I'm here now. But a lot of people know about Black Voters Matter Fund because of the Blackest Bus, right? We, that's, that's what has been the picture. What folks don't know is that it really is an outgrowth of over 20 years of organizing work and, and communities. And, and, you know, part of that experience of one, running campaigns, um, running ourselves, um, being victims of voter suppression um, is really an outgrowth in what created Black Voters Matter. Um, and anchors our work. We, we are not a civic engagement organization where we simply encourage people to vote. We consider ourselves a power building organization that anchors our issue, anchors voting as a tool to get the issues that matter to us on the ballot and in office. And so a lot of times when people see us and they, they see the bus, they don't really understand the model is really driven by power building based work. 
Um, and so we spend a lot of time in communities beyond election cycle, beyond election years. Sometimes when there's not an important election, we are helping people get important initiatives on the ballot, whether it's disenfranchisement, trying to make sure that voters who are disenfranchised because they had a criminal background, they're able to vote again. We support those initiatives. We support police commissions in states, like we supported the movement in Tennessee. So I just wanna, one of the things I just wanna add is that a lot of our work is centered around getting our our issues on the ballot and ultimately into office. Um, and that is what, and we use the blackest bus to drum up interest, but also give us a, you know, helps us go into communities that oftentimes don't get talked about. Um, so we take those, this bus into those communities because our interest is to go into black communities wherever we are and try to find ways to use voting to help us build power. Thank you, April. Tristan. Anchor yeah, Lee. so I will, I'll stay on brand on message and just allow the origin story to, you know, sort of share and, 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 and color our how and why. I'm mean, much like April just mentioned, this is about building and sustaining uh, community political power to effectuate change at the, uh, on the policy level, which we know pu public policy in a lot of ways um, dictates the material conditions that our communities live in. So. Woke Vote was born in 2017. We tested our theory of change in 2017 in Alabama's uh, U.S. Senate special election, and um, we're able to develop, as you mentioned in the in the in the onset, Tamar, um, a, a model that's acute and relational, direct voter, but really digging into how to build from within those communities the type of power because the goal is to sustain it. The goal is to create a culture of democratic civic participation in these communities so that this this currency of voting can be wielded you know on an ongoing basis um, that really does uh, uh, empower you know our communities to um, to be able to take control in a lot of ways of uh, of, of, of the conditions of, of our community so that's the that's the short and skinny version of it my rock star partner Dewana Thompson is a Birmingham native and what we saw in 2017 was historic turnout uh, in the black belt, which uh, changed the outcome of that election. So we were able to prove uh, the pretty, you know, I think meaningful case study, the real power of organizing what we view as the, the true swing voter is the voter who is between, you know, participating and not participating versus choosing between candidate A or candidate B. And, uh, and really, really invest in their participation on an ongoing basis. Um, and we were able to follow that up in 2018, and here we are now, looking to continue to build on that. Um, we're hopeful for the future of, uh, of access to the franchise being expanded and broadened uh, more and more. Thank you all for that. Uh, great origin stories, and I think there's clearly a common thread. Um, I had a series of questions that I had lined up, but I think you guys have touched on a lot of them, so I kind of want to take a little bit of a pivot. and. Because of this work, I've described this work as being um, data informed, very cold in the calculus in terms of how we have to measure outputs. What I'd like to hear from you all is your take on, you know, there is, I heard a rumor again that there's an election coming up in exactly 54 days. Um, and I'm wondering, how do you all balance this idea of trying to achieve an intermediate or short term goal by virtue of an electoral outcome? to so much of the sentiment that exists out there that maybe it just doesn't even matter, my vote doesn't matter, all of the different things that go into the subversive messaging that has seeped into so many of ours. Uh, how do you pull people up out of that mindset, push them towards an, an, an immediate goal with the understanding that, you know, have faith, there's a long-term goal that can still be achieved. Angela, do you mind kicking us off? Yeah, it's actually something I've been thinking about a lot. Um, when you do year-round organizing, you hear everything. Um, but and Angela, see, you have an advantage. There's an election like every three hours in Wisconsin. So that's true. That's you true. Know, you can it's cheat literally, like our next election is in February, right? Like there's right. November and then there's February. Like we, we don't get a break here. Um, and that's also why it's important for us to um, have some sort of year-round presence. The longest stretch we typically had was from um, April of last year to uh, February of this year. That's the longest stretch that we typically have. Um, but you hear everything. And, and what I often tell people is that there are sometimes we find ourselves having three separate conversations. One, we wanna turn a non-voter into a voter. 
I hear every single time. Um, I try, you know, COVID, COVID outside, but normally I would try to be on doors at least um, every, for not doors, for every ele election cycle. I try to get on doors myself as much as possible. Um, and it, it never fails. I always hear myself, even on election day, hey, are you voting? You know, your polling place is down the street. You want me to walk with you? Um, and they're like, no, like I've, I've voted before, nothing's changed. Like, what does it matter? And so we need to acknowledge that the system has failed people. Um, and, and I'm always a, I always try to challenge and push back when people try to shame people for not voting. There are reasons why people don't vote and we shouldn't shame people for that. We should just do our best to meet them where they're at and bring them along. People need to see um, the reason that their votes matter. Um, even just recently over the summer, I happened to be talking to a woman and um, she's telling me all the ways that um, society, the government has failed her. Um, heartbreaking story, um, you know, trauma and abuse. And I said, so are you voting in November? And she said, no, all I'm, my priority and my focus is to make sure that I'm taking care of my child. No one's gonna look out for us, no one has, that's my main priority. I was like, okay, so I flipped it. I was like, well, would you be interested in telling your story to the mayor and all the things you think the city should be doing better? She's like, absolutely, tell me when and where. And so she wasn't opposed to civic engagement as a whole. We need to reframe civic engagement as more than just voting. And our goal is to start as an entryway. And that's why we need to have a year-round conversation because if we're having you know, three separate conversations and the first one starts with turning a non-voter into a voter, the second one is having people understand the roles and responsibilities of the offices they're voting for. Instead of saying, hey, just vote for the state Supreme Court candidate that I'm telling you about. Do you know about what the state Supreme Court does? Do you know that they're 10 years terms? Do you know that high profile cases such as X, Y, and Z have all happened, have impacted you? And this is the candidate that we're supporting. Those are three separate conversations. You have that political education, and then you want people to support your own candidates. And that's not something that can happen now, right? Like we, that there's a reason why we've been having these conversations on a year round basis, because people need to, to, to know um, one the agency that they have within themselves, and also how the political system works. Everyone has an opinion. We notice that everyone has thoughts and feelings of what should change, but people don't know how to interject and make those interventions in a system that wasn't designed for us to participate in. So we need to be patient and have these conversations early and often as possible. I'm seeing nodding heads, and I don't know which one of you, April or Tristan, feels up to following that, but I'll leave it to you yeah. all to decide. Well, Go ahead, Tristan. <laughs> I'll, I'll jump in just to endorse all of that. I think Angela's exactly right. She's spot on. The key is to create a culture of participation. That means to, to identify entry points beyond voting. We say, you know, we have a saying in our, in our uh, woke vote work, you know, I think Rubik's, we say voting is a comma, not a period, right? Voting is just one form of the entire uh, democratic and civic engagement process, we should expand people's understanding about what civic, particip civic participation looks like so that we can engage folks. And I mean, to answer your question directly, Tamara, um, what do we say to, to the disaffected voter? And to answer this point, there are so many legitimate reasons for, you know, for why it's been made difficult. You know, access to the franchise isn't, voter suppression is expansive. Let's just put it that way, right? There's so many ways that folks uh, ability to vote is suppressed and a lot of it has to do with you know the economic conditions that folks live in but on a recent podcast the one and I both were speaking about uh, what those challenges were and frankly you know I'm grateful for that voter who says why should I vote it really does give us a chance to stay sharp and to really you know understand what's the case and to keep ourselves grounded and rooted in community again the swing voter is 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 taking someone who's a who's historically a non-voter or less likely the so-called low propensity voter and and invest in an experience that they can value so that they participate and that is sort of what we what we wake up you know and do every single day so we train and uh, our organizers to to focus on and one of the things that we've learned that that helps us find success is that this is not about candidate A or candidate B. This is actually about the lived experience of the person we're engaging. And when we when we center that lived experience from a from an equitable standpoint, we're able to prioritize that person's needs. To Angela's point, you know, the young lady was interested in, in sharing her story and her opinions, but needed an entry point to understand where where does that value, where should I assign that value? And voting is just but one form, right? 
So I think it's, it's you're able to make the case, all right, well, vote and, and, and. And that's, that's sort of the idea we have to have when it comes to folks um, who have been disaffected. It's first to understand that, you know, legitimately disaffected, disenfranchised, and really understand what that means. That is not a lack of will or desire. That is, there, there are actual impotences. There are things in the way of participation that have been constructed uh, intentionally in a lot of the ways, which is just awful. And we're working against that, number one. Two, to really center their lived experience so that they can actually uh, see value in the process that, you know, has, that they've been shut out of for a long time, all of us. So I think that I would just follow up as best I could, can with, you know, we should treat these, a lot of these folks are essential workers, right? We coming out of COVID, we should treat them as essential voters as well. And what would that look like? Well, it would mean to invest in uh, a real experience, civic participation, where we're finding entry points that value their lived experience so that they can exercise their, their right. April, before you chime in, let me offer you just a little bit of a wrinkle because these are obviously outstanding answers and they're, and they're nuanced. I'm not throwing a curveball at you, I promise. We're hearing a lot in this thread about community. We're hearing a lot in this thread about consistency and uh, depth of relationship, which to me leads to trust. So if you could just talk about the value, like keep the original question, but also because you guys established trust, that's a major, major component of this within these community, within community, because we're of the community. Could you speak a little bit about that and how you get to that point so that you can follow through and then have folks focus on what their intermediate goals may be and how it leads to longevity? Well, you know, we call the organization Black Voters Matter and not Black Votes Matter. And the, and the part of that is because every time someone says our organization, they're reaffirming that I matter, right? And so if people are wearing Black Voters Matter shirts, if they're saying Black Voters Matter, they're not talking about an organization, they're talking about themselves. And so one of the first things we don't do and to help build trust is we let the local folk do what they do and we fight to get resources to them to do what they do. In other words, I'm not trying to build a chapter of Black Voters Matter in a small community. What I'm trying to do are find the people that are doing the work in that community and ask them what do they need? What is your agenda? Because one of the things I don't assume is that lack of quote unquote output in an election means that that community does not have people who are doing and valuing and working um, to bring about change in their communities, right? So I believe, regardless of what the voter outcome is, we firmly believe that somebody in that community, organizations and people care about what's happening. What they've decided is that voting is not as effective as some other means. And so part of what we do is find those people, find those people and they're there, whether it's pastors at churches, whether there are city council people in one lowly district, whether there are just civic organizations, in a community, whether they're workers who at some point had to organize at their job, there are people who are finding ways to bring change. So we look for those change makers. And when we find those change makers, we ask them a very simple question. What is it that you need? And we honor our word and our involvement, which is we want to get you the resources for that. Do you need a voice? Do you need money? Do you need t-shirts? Do you need size? Do you need bands? Do you need data? What do you need? And we give that to them to do what they do best. If they need more expertise to understand how to use things like van, we, we find a vehicle to do it. If they want to lift their voice through texting, we try to provide it. In other words, we are a part of their team. And so in being a part of the team, as opposed to saying, this is what our agenda is, and we want you to come in, helps to build that trust. And so the connection between building trust, as well as what we do to get people to say, I don't want to vote, and I do now want to vote, is one, understanding, as has already been said so brilliantly, right, that there are more ways for you to participate and, and change your community, right? Civic participation or just changing your community. And we have to adopt that and believe that. Voting is important, but it's not been the premier form of change people in this country. In fact, through protest came the Voting Rights Act in 1965. We didn't vote that on a ballot, right? We had to protest for that. And so protest and boycotting really has been the permanent or revered form of organizing for our community. So we almost trust that more than we do voting. And when we tried to get voting, what we wanted to do as a people, right, was to find a way to strengthen 
We thought that in voting, we could find a way to strengthen our ability to bring in policy. So years of seeing the ineffectiveness of that, we continue to do what has been effective. And I will say this, the most recent protest in this summer, where we're talking about police brutality and things of that nature, that's not on a ballot, but yet you're seeing communities making changes. And so what we do, and let me bring it back to voting, right, is we show that just as you are demonstrating and protesting and you're making change, now what we can do is connect voting to making sure that those representatives follow the mandates that we're saying on the street. So you got to vote that sheriff in. You got to vote that mayor in who's going to then appoint the, 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 you know, the chief of police. We got to vote a DA in. And so you make it scientific and you make it make sense so that all the good work you're doing already in your community bringing change to those other mechanisms, this is how voting can complement and augment and continue the process of bringing power. It's got to make sense to folks. So it's not rocket science is what I'm trying to say. People do things that work. And so when voting begins to work for them, they will begin to participate more. And, it's, it, and, and I, will say, I will say this. When I, in, in 19, in, in, in 2000, I was living in Selma, Alabama, and the person who was mayor was Joe Smitherman. Joe Smitherman may mean nothing to no one, but let me tell you who he was. He was the same mayor in 2000 that looked at Martin Luther King and called him Martin Luther Coon. In other words, the same mayor in 2000 was the same person in place when we saw Martin Luther King, C.T. Vivian, John Lewis getting beat on the bridge, he was the same mayor. And so we were determined as a young attorney living in Selma, Alabama to change that, right? And so the community had been electing him over and over again, despite his history, right? But they didn't see the connection between how their current life that they were living was connected to the mayor who had also been in place during that time period in our history. And so part of our movement at that time was one, examining that history and then connecting the dots of how that history was continuing to create an environment where our community, black, black folks, were living less than and were still in poverty after that many years. And when that connection was made, we saw an outpouring of citizens voting him out that was tantamount to Soweto. And at that evening when he was unelected, people were celebrating and dancing in the street. And so what I'm saying, and I provide that background because that's what people need. People need to see that voting works just as much as protesting works, just as much as marching works, just as much as boycotting work. And when you have a community that can make that connection, you will not have to ask this question anymore. You will have a community that's ready to go in any election because they will see how it matters. So it's our job, right? to help communities continue to see how those two things work together, instead of just asking them to do it. I'm gonna let that breathe for a minute. Um, so in no way do I want to patronize, but these were, those three responses that we all just heard um, were more than just like goosebump inducing. They are, um, incredibly deeply founded and something that we all should pay an awful lot of attention to. None of those messages, my conclusion that I got, and I think it's pretty obvious, nothing that you all just conveyed can happen if you drop in a month before an election and just start extracting and just start dealing with things as though they're a transaction. Um, thank you all for those thoughts. I don't think it was a wasted word in anything that you shared. Uh, I'd like to ask you guys, I'm trying to figure out how to pivot. I'm moved by what I've heard. Um, and I know you all, so <laughs> none of this is a surprise, but it's still quite moving. Um, so the question I'll have is, with all the engagement that you have um, been a part of for, for so long, and within all of these communities, since uh, the murder of George Floyd in May, 20, May of this year, there has been sort of a turbocharged injection of energy. I'm curious as to, through everything you spoke about, through the, 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 the long-term methods that you all deploy and everything you know in terms of getting folks eyes educated, building the trust, mobilized, and having it to April's final point, make it to where you don't even have to ask the question anymore because it is just part of life. 
Um, what do you do? How, how do you view that, those turbocharged moments? And how do you make the most of them uh, in the midst of everything else that you're already thinking about? By the way, I recognize that question in and of itself comes across as slightly opportunistic in terms of the way that it sounds. But there is an undeniable energy, and I'm curious as to how you all view that when you see it coming. Let's start, let's start with Tristan. And uh, give me some thoughts there, if you don't mind. Yeah. Um, I think so. It's a great it's a great question. And, and, you know, I appreciate your sensitivity to the circumstance. Right. I think we all are. Uh, but there is a reality that, you know, it's hard to to miss. And so interestingly enough, um, you know, part of what we do at Think Rubik's is to make sure that we don't speak at things, but we get engaged and, and, and we get on the ground. So despite COVID, despite um, a lot of other things that are that were happening, uh, our team got on the ground out in Minneapolis to support, you know, um, and and stand with and uh, and be there. I myself am quite familiar with the community in Minneapolis, uh, such a vibrant organizing community. I wasn't at all surprised um, at some of the change that they were able to effectuate so quickly. Um, I think in a lot of ways, uh, what we saw was, was a model of what engagement ought to look like. And the, the, I mean, the most beautiful thing about the response to this, you know, um, uh, sort of harrowing tragedy um, that seems to continue to repeat itself is the diversity of the people uh, that came together that you know, black led, sure, uh, but just such a a diversity of young people and folks in general getting engaged and getting out there and, and beating the pavement. I think um, I think part of capturing the energy is recognizing what's actually taking place and being able to honor that. That's number one. And I think also is is following the interest and kind of keep coming back to this is where are the people so oddly enough like when we get on the ground i think angela spoke to this earlier and uh in april as well in that dynamic sermonette i love a good sermonette um <laughs> is is that you you when you when you get on the ground um you're actually following the leader you know folks may not fully understand their 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 empowerment and what's really taking place but you know we're there to put fuel by in the tank and to you know just help push the car forward and in a lot of ways, there's generally so much activity already happening in these places. I mean, the one thing we have to tell people is that, um, you know, we don't have one national election. We have 50 state elections and a whole bevy of like local elections that take place. This really is ground up and it always has been, right? So when when we keep that in our minds, we're, we get on the ground and we look for um, those who are doing the work and we seek to empower those folks and you know th and that really is key to you know any formula is really understanding what's already there and then and then you're doing your level best to empower that and what we've witnessed i think has been um a, a real response to that local leadership those uh those those leaders on the ground who have been on the ground working for in some cases decades at a time finally getting that breakthrough to do what april mentioned earlier which is to, is to give is to speak proof positive to the power of participating, to getting engaged, exercising your voice, to organizing your communities and your neighborhoods and having conversations, real conversations about what matters to you and, and making enough, enough material. Um, so in a lot of ways, I think, you know, we, we witnessed, um, I think a case study on, on what engagement ought to look like coming out of Minneapolis. And that's on the backs of so many more revolutionaries who had come just before out of Ferguson, out of Baltimore, out of, uh, Florida, out of all other parts of the of the country, and in parts where um, we have been overlooked for some time, and and it's it really you know no pun intended it's 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 caught like wildfire, and though the cameras may not be on the ground anymore, people are still organizing and working, and 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 they know the power of both the protest and the power that we have to bring to bear, and I feel we've I feel in a lot of ways uh, these are catalytic moments that have converted folks into real activist leaders, activist voters, activist participants. And, you know, we're going to the polls not for candidate A or candidate B, but we're going to the polls because we witnessed, you know, mm -hmm. real inequity um, firsthand in ways I don't think our generation's ever seen before. 
And, and that is, I think, you know, that's the, in a lot of ways, the communities have already captured the energy. It's our job on a platform to put it on a stage to make sure that everyone else gets to bear witness as well. Thank you. Angela, before you answer, I'll just throw this in there. I, when, when the protests started really catching, like when they really took off, I, I did, I always do canvases. I always try to figure out what people like you, what you all are thinking. And I called Angela just for the good of the group. And she gave me the quote of the year to me. I'm like, okay, so what's happening now? How can we help? What do we need to know? What do we need to make people more aware of? What do you need to get ready to which Angela quickly replied? We didn't have to get ready because we stay ready. And I love that. Like, I could not love that comment more. Angela, do you mind? offering a little bit more here? Yeah, um, as you all know, I'm, I'm in Milwaukee. Um, Milwaukee is only about 40 miles north of Kenosha um, in the events that unfolded um, specifically with Jacob Blake. So that's kind of rocked our whole community. Um, and we've also had numerous protests since the murder of George Floyd and Breonna Taylor. Um, and a lot of folks immediately after the protest first started, within a few days, people were calling me and they were like, Angela, you need to go out there and you need to have a clipboard and register people to vote. And I had to push, I, I had to like calm it down. Like a lot of what we do is electoral based. Um, and what I said is people are burning shit down. They're not trying to think about registering to vote in this moment. And we need to honor where folks are at. And in my gut, which I'm, I'm learning more and more lately to trust, is I was like, there's going to be a pivot. I don't know when and where, but there's going to be a pivot where people are ready to make that jump to an electoral conversation. It's not gonna be when they're burning down a target or a, a police precinct. And we need to honor people's anger in that moment. And right now, as expected, we're starting to see that pivot. We're starting to see that shift because we're getting closer to the election. More and more people are getting pressed. They're getting mailers, they're getting calls, they're getting text messages. It's more and more coming to the front of people's mind. Um, I figured, I was like, after Labor Day, there's gonna be a, a huge pivot. It's gonna be, you know, all, you know, all speed ahead. And so I think it's important to honor where folks are at um, and also really talk about and, and challenge the ideas of, of what it means to, to protest, right? Because I think a lot of times people are like, oh, well, you know, you should be registering people to vote or you should be talking about the candidates and encouraging people to vote for Joe Biden. And I was like, you know, if you're protesting, you're already, uh, protest in and of itself is a, a direct challenge to the status quo. In a lot of ways, um, good, bad, or otherwise, voting is a part of the status quo, right? And so those two things, there's a disconnect there. And we can't um, forcibly, you know, try to make these things come together. The community naturally is going to tell you when they're ready to have these conversations. Um, and so what we've been doing, we've been having a mix of electoral type of conversations and what we're calling wellness checks. We can't just text only about the election and ignore all the challenges that our people are going through because we would be just as bad as any other organization that would parachute in and is only just trying to extract our votes. And so we also are saying, you know, how can we best show up in this moment? Shortly after um, the protests in, in Minneapolis and the, and the ones that started here in Milwaukee, it was a tough weekend. And it always creeps in my head, am I doing enough? Are we doing enough? What is my role in this moment? Um, I've never been in this particular moment in this role before. How can I best show up? So I did a lot of reflecting and we had a staff meeting and I was like, what do we think our role should be in this moment? And we kind of came to the same conclusions that I came to over that weekend and some alignment of like, let's continue to amplify the policy that we had been talking about. We had been working with coalition partners since last year about divesting nearly 50% of our city budget from the police department into our community. We already started that groundwork last year. We've been having these conversations. And so we all kind of came to this agreement and our program director was like, okay, we're all in agreement internally why don't we text people and ask people? Like, let's ask people. We created a Google form. How best can we show up for you in this moment? Do you need to be connected to resources? If you can wave a wand and fix all of the problems right now when it comes to law enforcement, what would they be? And so being able to have that constant relationship and trust and engagement with people is incredibly important because when you do make those pivots, if you don't build all of that, that relationship up, you're just like any organization that comes in two or three weeks you know, before an election. And it, it's very transactional. But if you built that relationship, 
and you've had all those conversations leading up to it, those electoral conversations are a lot more impactful. People receive them better and people trust you more. So to me, it, you know, it wasn't about pushing an agenda. We knew the, that white supremacy and misogyny and transphobia, we know all of that is on the ballot in November. It is a referendum of those things. And, and we know how important it is, but we couldn't, we couldn't be um, too preemptive if the community wasn't ready and the protesters weren't ready conversation, we can't shove that down their throats. And we knew that there would be a moment where there would be a pivot, a natural pivot, and then we would be there to have those conversations. Thank you. All right, April, you know you're up and I'm gonna tell you that I'm not gonna throw a curveball at you even though I'm throwing a curveball at you. Uh, so what I'd like for you to do as you answer this question, I also want you to, to um, sort of Considering the audience that we have on the line, we've got about 70 participants. I'd like for you to also think a little bit about how these are business leaders by and large that are with us. Mm -hmm. Many of them are um, heads of corporations and, and, and divisions within corporations. So as you start thinking about the turbocharge question, also do me a favor and give us uh, your thoughts on how corporations can be positive influences how can we influence corporations to help push our momentum in a righteous way? Is that yeah. convoluted yeah. enough for you, April? <laughs> yes, it is. I think, you You're know, welcome. What's, what's interesting is, you know, in terms of the turbo charge question, ditto that what's already been said. I, I really don't have much to offer. I will say this, um, the pivot is happening. When we were in Kentucky, Louisville, uh, just a few months ago, um, we went at the invitation of uh, Black Lives Matter organizer, as well as the Urban League chairperson, who is really, really, you know, you know, very anchored in that community. And so we brought our bus and we brought some resources to the, because at the time in Jefferson County, they had actually consolidated all of the polling places and put them into one arena. Right. And so we knew that either it was going to be genius or it was going to be a nightmare. We knew one of the two would happen. And so when we, we, we arrived, um, it appeared to be working until that evening when they tried to shut it down and stop um, a lines and lines of voters from voting. And so Louisville, as you understand, is in the middle in the thrust of the protests around Breonna Taylor, and they are protesting every single day to bring attention to, and I, and, and I, and I just want to add that today would be a great day, you know, to charge the officers who killed her. And so that community is in the throes of that every single day. And that day when they closed down those polling places, let me tell you, and in, in, in having done voter work for 20 something years, what typically happens is people get a little sad, they get mad, they call a 1-800 number, but they leave. Not on this day, right? Not on this day. On this day, folks got to the door and were banging on the door, let me in and vote, right? So when people, and, and, and I wanna say that that really is an extension of the protest that was happening in the street. Like they were saying, not today and not on my watch, will this young woman be murdered and her killers not brought to justice? Not on this day will I not be able to vote because they, were, they already saw the connection of me coming and voting in this primary, right? To changing who this DA is gonna be, who this sheriff is gonna be. And so that banging on the door was the throwing up of the fence and the signs in the pro protest. So there's already a pivot being made right now where people see that my voice on the streets can also be uplifted on, you know, on, in, on, the, on the ballot box. And I'm not gonna let, you're not gonna stop me from doing that. And so what we saw in Louisville, we're already seeing in an uptick right now of folks applying for applications for absentee ballots. In little old Alabama, where folks always throw it off and say that it's not even a state that's worth looking at. Right now, in one county alone, you may they already have like over 5,000 people who've applied to vote absentee in Alabama. That's not a sign of a state who, that's normally written off where folks think that I, that I can't do it because they also know that three years ago, they put the senator in place that, that, that began to tilt the power in Congress. So what I'm saying is when voting works, when people see that their voice works, 
they will use whatever tools available. And we're already starting to see in many of these communities already trying uptick in numbers, applying for absentee ballots, upticks in registration. So using the traditional matrix, we already start to see a shift of this pivot between going out in the streets and seeing voting as a tool to continue our struggle for liberation. So I just want to lead with that so that we can all be encouraged that the approach that you're taking, Angela, right now and waiting is good because people are already ready to bring about change. Because like you said, white supremacy is on the ballot this year for a lot of communities of color. But what's also on the ballot is we don't want to die because we understand disproportionately COVID and to the COVID-19 crisis is, 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 is disproportionately impacting black and brown communities. So people are already passionate about getting someone in office who might have some sense just even on keeping me alive, right? Not only from the police, but from public health. So we do see that shift already happening in this supercharged moment. And what we got to do is continue to carry that message that's already out in the streets on into November. And that's what Black Voters Matter. And I know my brothers, I know Woke Vote, and I know you, Angela, are already doing in our community. So, so I feel very confident and encouraged and empowered. Not naively, right? But understanding that this is a vital moment and like we all feel it, everybody in the community feels it. And I can't remember your second question that you had. I know it's compounded. I can't even remember. That's, that's, all, that's, that's on me. On that. That's a sign of an A plus moderator when the uh, when the panel can't even remember what he asked. Um, so we've got like I'm gonna we've got about four minutes until we need yeah. to, to to jump. What I want to ask is just for each of you to give me about 45 seconds on or a minute on like we've got business leaders here on the line. Let's push them. You know what I mean? What is the the borderline uncomfortable ask? What can we go to businesses and say? This is how a corporation can get behind this moment and help these people become better represented, have some long, you know, long-term enfranchisement to, un to try and undo so much of the scarring as a result of generations of disenfranchisement. And if, if you want, April, we can push to Angela and let you yeah. think about that for a second. Angela, why don't you go ahead and give us your ideas there? Yeah, I think specifically when it comes to corporations and businesses, there needs to be an internal strategy and an audit as well as an external one. Um, it's not enough to just say, I'm going to donate 10% of my proceeds to a local organization, but your own internal structure is toxic to people of color, specifically Black folks. That's not helpful. Um, I think there are times that people want to just donate to score some political points, but really aren't taking it seriously. Um, and so I encourage folks to think about their own internal uh, structures um, and, and figuring out how are they able to walk the walk and not just, you know, throw money at a local Black Lives Matter type of organization and think that that's the best thing that you can do, although we will gladly take your money. Um, so I always give people three specific ways, whether they're in the business community or otherwise, of way folks can be helpful. One, I would be a bad executive director if we don't make a fundraising pitch, right? All of this work specifically on a year round um, basis takes money. A lot of folks like to throw money at our organizations a few weeks, maybe even a few months before an election and then um, expect us to somehow sustain and then we have to reinvent the wheel. Um, actually, if you want a bigger bang for your buck, you need to invest in me in a year round basis because I can produce that electoral outcome um, versus if you just- Say that, wait, wait, wait. Say that last sentence again, especially the part where you as a black Black woman said, you need to invest in me. Say that again, please, <laughs> louder for the people in the back. You need to invest in our work in a year-round basis. And, and if people actually want a, a better return on investment, your money would go a lot further um, in a year-round basis, in March of next year, in February of next year, versus just October of this year, or a couple weeks or a couple months before an election. Because again, I think we've all outlined the importance of year-round organizing. So money is important. Two, um, we always are looking for other folks to, to connect with. You know, are there people who, um, who you think that we should know? Other organizations, um, you know, other individuals, even other people that may be potentially interested in donating. donating. We're interested in, in all of that. I think a lot of us are always looking for ways to be um, connected to each other um, and figure out different ways that, that we can um, collaborate and really amplify each other's message. And the last thing that I would say is that, you know, understanding not everybody always has the financial resources or the networks, um, amplifying our content um, as organizations. One, it's
to uh, get our reach out there as far and wide as possible, but also in these moments of really tense racial tension, it's important to amplify the lived experiences and perspectives of folks on the ground and um, of the lived experiences of the communities that are constantly being attacked. So whether it's amplifying our contact or our content, donating or, or um, putting us in connections with other organizations, other press or other ways for us to get our message out there. Kristen, can you give us 60 seconds? Yeah, um, I, you know, Angela speaks for me a lot of times. I say that, but I mean it. Uh, <laughs> investing in the work is, is so important and doing so early and often is also critically important. The one thing I'd say is that, you know, corporations and the private sector more broadly has to get in the game and for some to, you know, stay in the game. And what I mean by that is that, is that the name of this panel is Voting Power and Equity. There is absolutely a significant role for corporations and private sector to play in voting and building power and in equity. And I think what it looks like is to answer like a real examination of your business practice and your and how you're approaching doing your work. And frankly, you have to ask your question, have we have we built equity into our our, our, our product or our process or our, our strategy. And I, I say that, you know, think Rubik's shameless plug here. We're a social innovation consultancy with that equity lens because we know that it's more than just, you know, voting. It's actually really about, you know, it's, it's really the economy, you know, um, and how this affects people's uh, daily lives in a lot of ways. There's such missed opportunity, I think, when we don't engage corporations in the private sector uh, more intentionally, uh, particularly with as we are third party outfits, you know, who aren't tied to any particular, you know, interest group, we're tied to black liberation in a lot of ways. That's the point of uh, of a lot of the work that we do. And then that the equity work that we do is like squarely hinged in that space. So getting in the game, examining uh, your practices and really building into your strategies, equity, ask yourself, are we the best partners we can be to the movement to struggle? to the case and cause for uh, freedom and equity and, um, and, and how much more, how deep, how much more can we go? And, and, I'll, and I'll finish by, I'll close by saying this. Um, we've got an election on November 3rd. November 4th starts what we call accountability season. And it won't just be those who are elected who will be held accountable. And I think we're starting to see a lot more of, of, of this preview uh, in the in the movement spaces in the run up to and some of the uh, the protest protest and direct actions that have taken place over the summer, we're starting to see corporate sector uh, corporations and private sector really be held accountable in a lot of ways because they have such an important role to play in how we effectuate change. And so I'd say, you know, ask those tough questions now. Lift up the voices of those who have those lived experiences inside of your shops and engage with us on the outside so we can figure out how we can really work together uh, to build the type of equitable society that we all kind of we we all imagine because um, accountability season is near <laughs> and time is coming thank you and this year account i have to say this year accountability season starting on november 4th is actually going to be accountability for counting the damn votes like there's a lot there are a number, number of scenarios that we need to be very very diligent about um april you're going to wrap us up here. We're running. Yeah, I was going to wrap it up, but I'm not going to repeat because what they've said is brilliant. You know, in terms of the three prong approach, I thought Angela said, toxic, examine your internal culture, give money all the time and frequently, not just election cycles, you know, and, 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 and finding ways to anchor culture. All, all I will end with is this this is a time to be really courageous. This is a time to be brave. There were probably several moments in American history where this was a moment. Um, whether it was to end slavery, right? Whether it, when, when American had to decide, you know, from uh, that they wanted to be separated from Britain, when they had to decide what country were we going to be, were we going to be a country that ultimately continued slave enslavement, or were we going to be a country that continued to take the descendants of those slaves and still not give them rights? And so decisions have consistently and historically had to be made. This is one of those times. And so what I would invite corporations um, who are made up of people, right? They're not just, you know, I often as a lawyer, I'm real, you know, slow to say that because the Citizens United and we're all, you know, concerned when the court made a corporation a citizen, but yet it is made up of people. And this is a time to be courageous, uh, not only individually in how we act and what we do, but as businesses and what businesses do. I think businesses have to decide in this moment if they are going to continue to be a part. And this is not a Republican or a Democrat question. It's not. 
right? I know that it's been couched that way, but it is not. It is a very simple question. Are you gonna be on the side of continuing the push to end white supremacy, right? And ending the vestiges of slavery that still exist or not? And so when you are deciding how you're gonna change your toxic culture, change your culture internally, when you decide how you're going to participate outside of your organization, this, this needs to be a centerpiece. And so I invite you know, the, the participants who are corporations to really seize this moment and to be on the side of, the, of, of, of I am gonna be a part of ending white supremacy in this country, letting it stop being you know, a part of the brick and mortar and tearing it down and rebuilding something that looks like an inclusive democracy. And so to ditto to everything they said, but I, I just think in this moment, it's important for all of us to really feel the importance of what we're facing right now. Because even what happens on November the 3rd, that work will continue. And we need everybody to be on board with this movement. And so that's what I would invite corporations to be thinking about. It's in their branding departments, whether it's in their corporate board meetings, it's how are we gonna play a role right now in dismantling this in this country forever and for good. Amen. And you got Thank some you, wonderful sir. people on here who can help <laughs> do that. That's right, right, that's right. Listen, to the three of you, thank you so much. A um, little bit over time here, pushing it now to, uh, seriously, I, I think we've all been enriched in definitive ways by this conversation. Uh, Michael Mori at Dahlberg has some closing remarks and I'll just once again say thank you. Hi everyone, uh, thank you so much for attending the webinar. Uh, we're very thrilled that you all made the time and gave your attention to us and our incredible panelists. And I want to thank April and Angela and Tristan and also our moderator, Tamar. Uh, this is a fantastic session. Um, uh, so my name is Michael Morey. I'm an associate partner with Dahlberg and a member of our Justice, Equity, and Mobility community of practice. As Menahil mentioned at the top of the webinar, Dahlberg is a global group of social enterprises working to build a more inclusive and sustainable world. And GEM is our community of practice focused on social justice and racial justice in the United States. Today's webinar is the fourth in Dahlberg's Shaping an Equitable Future in the US series. As some of you may have seen, our previous two sessions uh, co-convened with Common Future focused on how philanthropy can shift power uh, to advance racial justice. Um, as we developed the series, we thought it was important to reflect on the essential role exercising our democratic power plays in creating a just future for all of us and the ways in which we can build the electoral power of the people and communities of color whose voices are actively being suppressed by those who, don't, who do not wish to hear them or to see their power. Uh, supporting the rights of everyone to vote, uh, especially those who have for so long and in so many ways been violently oppressed and dispossessed of their political freedom is fundamental to creating a more fair and just society. At Dahlberg, we, we understand that, but we also understand that voting alone is not sufficient, which is why we are also committed to building the economic power of Black and Latinx communities, workers of women. And this includes, amongst others, our efforts with partners like Common Future, with partners like Living Cities, who we help develop a strategy to scale home ownership for people of color in order to narrow the racial wealth gap and improve economic well-being in urban areas. Uh, uh, and the Boston Federal Reserve and a number of others. Um, at, at Dahlberg and particularly within our justice, equity and mobility practice, uh, we're striving to make change in our community through our work, through our action, and most importantly, through our partners like Leadership Now, whom we've been honored to support since its founding by Dan Daniela Bayou Ares, who was part of the Dahlberg team for almost 15 years. Um, similarly, we invite you to support uh, the amazing panelists and their organizations who, who you all had a chance to hear from uh, today. And with that, and on behalf of Dahlberg and the Leadership Now team, I want to thank you all for joining us today. And as we mentioned at the top of the webinar, we've recorded the session and we'll email it to you all with links to the prior three webinars in case you're interested in listening. And those were also fantastic sessions with in in incredibly powerful speakers uh, making some really, really important points. Um, particularly if you're interested in 
issues of, of racial justice within philanthropy and the social sector. So definitely encourage you to check those out. And I know we're over time, so I'm going to sign off with that. Thank you all. <laughs>